This is co-chair Representative Rena Moran. Pursuit to House Rule 10.01. I call the remote hearing of the Select Committee on Racial Justice to order. We do have a quorum, so that is great. Um, Vice, uh, Vice Chair uh, Damon, have you had a chance to look over the minutes for September the 22nd? Hey, Chair Moran, I do not have those minutes yet. Okay, do everyone, were the minutes sent out to everyone? Uh, Chair Moran, perhaps they were not. We will look into that. Okay. Thank you. All right, please look into that and we will come back um, to hopefully try to uh, approve the minutes from September the 22nd. Okay, well, um, we will move on until then. Um, so I always like to really make some opening, opening remarks. And then once I made some opening remarks, I would definitely like for um, to pass it on to Representative Damon to do some opening remarks. And then for Representative Ruth Richardson to also make some opening remarks. Um, last week, I talked about um, the legislature and the impact that COVID-19 has had on us as a body to be able to uh, for us to not be able to meet in person. And because of that, we have been doing our hearings remotely via Zoom. And today, this is a product of where we are in this pandemic. Uh, but it's also creating an opportunity, an opportunity for us to do our work via Zoom uh, and to open up a space where uh, our constituency can be present um, they can be a part of our committee hearing, you know, in a way that many had not been able to do because either they were working or, it's, you know, uh, uh, just dealing with life. And so with this opportunity, it allows us to be present before folks, not only in the state of Minnesota, but possibly, you know, across the country, across the world. Isn't that an awesome thing? I, I think it is. And so because of that, I would like to just ask our members, our representatives uh, to please be present. And if you can, to turn your videos on so that your constituency in the world can see you. That would be awesome. Uh, as long as you can do that and do that safely. So uh, we have some awesome um, individuals today who will be presenting. Um, and what we have decided to do as a committee, instead of having our testifiers present and then having the public ask questions, we have designated um, a, a hearing on October the 13th at one o'clock that will be designated just for public hearings. We are in the process of moving, uh, having that hearing uh, from one to three to one to four. And that would be based on the number of people who decide that they would like to um, testify in the select committee on racial justice. So I'm really happy that we have created that, that space for that to happen. Let's see. Um, and we have created um, many different ways in which you can testify. So people can, you can sign up to testify via Zoom. You can submit a written testimony or you can leave a voicemail for a testimony if you are unable to appear via Zoom. Uh, people can contact our committee legislative assistant who is Benta, Benta Kate. That is B-I-N-T-A, Kate is K-A-N-T-E-H, to sign up. And information will be on the committee web pages. So remember, you can testify in person, do a written testimony, or you can also leave a voicemail. Because it's important that we create a space for the public to have some input. Uh, so our members, uh, we have, I think, an, an, an awesome opportunity to learn a little bit more about ACES. As an early childhood advocate, uh, I know 
And I know many of you know the importance of those early years uh, of life. And that, you know, I know I am a product of my childhood and I think many of us are a product of my childhood. And so um, I'm excited to bring ACES to this committee today. ACES is Adverse Childhood Experiences uh, to hear and learn about ACES and how racism plays uh, a role in, in, uh, in ACES. You know, we will hear about the science, the research, and also the study of ACES. So members, I am pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Wendy Ellis and Dr. William Dietz. Uh, you should have received some documents from, uh, from them regarding ACES. Uh, in your email and post it online. So if you have not, it, 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 that information is also online. Um, and I ask as they both present, they were gonna be like a team printing, uh, presenting together and that we save your questions until um, after they present. And so if you have those burning questions and you know, please write them down so that you don't forget so that we can go directly after their presentations into members' questions. And so with that, I would like to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Ellis. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Deese, Bill Deese, who will present first. Um, Dr. Deese, could you please introduce yourself uh, and then proceed with your um, presentation? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Representative Moran, and, and uh, also Representative. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Deese. Could you hold off for one second? Because I made an opening statement in which I said that I will promise that I would pass this over to my colleague, uh, Representative Damon, to make an opening statement. And so, Representative Damon, if you can do that now, that would be great. Thank you, Chair Moran, and to the committee members and those in the public that are viewing, um, thank you for engaging in this important information. The Select Committee on Racial Justice, um, the work that we have been charged to do is very important. Last week, we heard the testimony defining racism and also the effects that it had on maternal and infant health, and we all learned much from that. Today, as Chair Moran has talked um, and given the introduction that we'll be learning about ACEs and the effect that racism has on this topic. As our committee continues to work in a bipartisan way, we're examining data that will help in identifying what steps may be taken to move Minnesota forward with positive and sustainable solutions. I look forward to this work and I thank you for um, your engagement at this time. Thank you, Representative Damon. Uh, Representative Richardson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and also thank you to Vice Chair uh, Damon for her opening remarks as well. And I also want to thank all of the committee members for joining us uh, this week and for our, our speakers as well. We know that the research is clear that there's a connection between adverse childhood experiences and poor health outcomes, and that can lead to issues uh, such as hypertension and diabetes. And the research is also very clear that experiencing racism is an in and of itself an adverse childhood experience that can lead to toxic stress and hinder neurological development. It matters that we have these conversations and it matters that we ask about racism when we're taking into account a trauma history because this type of early assault harms the developing brains of children and can contribute to how they respond to stress. And those effects can also show up uh, decades later in life if left unmitigated. With what we know now through the research of ACEs, we are experiencing a paradigm shift. So we're moving, we've moved away from the idea of asking people what's wrong with you to really asking what happened to you. And I think that that's such an important conversation to be having as we think about addressing and mitigating the effects of, of ACEs. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, informational hearing because we know that there are not only social costs to ACEs, but there are, ec there are real economic costs to uh, ACEs as well. And those costs are very high. 
and that we need a multi-tiered approach that includes not only preventing ACEs from happening, so thinking about moving further upstream, but also working to mitigate the effects for individuals who have experienced ACEs as well. So such a timely conversation to be having and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Representative Richardson. So with that, I would now like to present Dr. Deeks to you. Um, thank you, Representative Moran and, and Representative Richardson and also Damon. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and joining you and the rest of the Select Committee on um, Racial Justice. It's a real pleasure and uh, thank you for, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bill Dietz. Um, I'm an MD, PhD pediatrician. Uh, I spent a good part of my career in uh, academic medicine in Boston. And in 1997, I moved to the Centers for Disease Control, where I became the director of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. And I was there till 2012 and moved to DC uh, to take the chair of the Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness at George Washington University. <clears throat> um, and um, my work throughout my career has been on childhood obesity. And uh, I was um, really uh, entranced by the work that Vince Felitti published in 1998. Um, Dr. Felitti was an internist in Kaiser Permanente in Southern California and recognized um, that in his clinic, which was an obesity clinic, that a number of the women that he was seeing had been exposed to adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and he developed the first uh, real criteria for the diagnosis of <clears throat> adverse childhood experiences. But the point about uh, Vince's work that's so important is that he described this in middle-class women, uh, well-insured in Southern California. That was where it started. And subsequently, uh, the, the assessment has been broadened and, and the impact has been broadened. So I'd now like to try to share my screen see if I can get this up. Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it. Great. So um, as, as Dr. Felitti said and, and observed, uh, these adverse childhood experiences, which are at the top of this tree, include things like maternal depression, either uh, being subject to or witnessing emotional or sexual abuse, substance abuse uh, like alcohol, uh, tobacco, and, and harder drugs, domestic violence, homelessness, incarceration, mental illness, divorce, physical and emotional neglect. Those, um, those vary from study to study, but that's really the core. Um, and we are fortunate enough to have some very rich data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a system at the CDC that assesses on a year-by-year -year basis the prevalence of a variety of factors um, in local in, in states. So it's a, a representative survey of states. And a couple of years ago, um, the um, specific questions were added about the exposure to adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and the results are, were quite interesting. Um, over uh, almost 50% of individuals had no adverse childhood experiences. But of concern, up to 25% of individuals had three or more of these experiences. Um, the distribution by race is pertinent. Um, about 15, and, and this came from a separate study in which the question was uh, who had more than four, greater than or equal to four adverse childhood experiences. And in that study, about 15% of white individuals uh, had four or more adverse childhood experiences, 18% of African Americans, and 28% of indigenous peoples. Um, so there's quite a, a substantial burden. Um, the important point here is that the higher the dose, the higher the exposure, the more of these experiences that someone is subjected to, the greater the likelihood of adverse consequences. And, and Representative Richardson mentioned these, that the uh, what, what happens is something called toxic stress, which is a consequence of repeated stresses um, that uh, lead to an enhanced vigilance on the part of children uh, with high doses of cortisol, a stress hormone, high doses of epinephrine and norepinephrine. 
and are, these are readily triggered by additional stresses. And as Representative Richardson noted, they lead to uh, impairment of the neural connections, particularly in, in young children. And the greater the dose, the, the more of these experiences that someone is exposed to, the greater the likelihood of toxic stress. The other point about this is that these are uh, not one generational exposures. Uh, there are, there's um, good evidence that these are transmitted across generations so that what a grandparent suffers may be passed on to uh, her uh, or his uh, daughter or son and in turn passed on to uh, young children. Now this has, these exposures uh, as, as Representative Richardson noted, have major consequences for disease. Um, for example, um, there's an increased rate of ischemic heart disease, uh, of cancer, stroke, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, and as uh, Dr. Flitty noted, uh, an increase in the, the prevalence of severe obesity. And these account for a substantial proportion of adult diseases. So almost 13% of all heart, heart disease may be associated with these exposures, uh, as much as 27% uh, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease may be associated with these, uh, these adverse effects. Um, so the other point here is that it, these exposures are not just limited to diseases like heart disease, obesity, or uh, uh, cancer or obstructive pulmonary disease. They are also associated with a variety of behaviors like tobacco use, illicit drug use, um, sexually transmitted diseases, unintended pregnancies, school dropouts, incarceration, uh, attempted suicide, a variety of these behaviors which are a consequence of the toxic stress and, and these early exposures. Um, and these point to the need to build resilience to uh, in what does it take to enable children uh, to recover from these exposures. And, and uh, Wendy will address that in somewhat greater detail. Um, but it's also important to realize that these are not exposures that are um, limited to the immediate environment that these children live in. That the roots of this tree, uh, which represents the adverse childhood experiences, includes the adverse community environments, something we call the pair of aces. Adverse childhood experiences in the context of adverse community environments. And you can see here that the, uh, the types of things that are at the roots of this tree uh, either nurture or contribute to adverse childhood experiences. So poverty, discrimination, community of disruption, lack of opportunity, economic mobility and social capital, lack of uh, education, encounters with the criminal justice system as a consequence of violence or not violence, poor housing quality and affordability. These are, are not conditions of choice. These are conditions that, uh, that we believe are a consequence of, of structural racism. Um, people don't, um, don't choose to live in these conditions. These are conditions that white supremacy, white racism has enforced uh, on these communities by virtue of structural racism. Um, now I'd like to share with you um, some, something that um, was said 50 years ago by the Kerner Commission. Uh, this was uh, followed the Watts riots. Uh, and what um, the Kerner Commission concluded was quote, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. And the report um, pointed out that the first level of these exposures was police practices, unemployment, and underemployment, and in inadequate housing. And this issue is a, 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 an issue that the white dominant community needs to come to terms with. We need to start with ourselves, our families, our institutions, our communities, and uh, ultimately our states. Um, this, is a, this is a problem that uh, cannot and should not be, served, be, be um, uh, addressed by um, minority groups like African-Americans or uh, the indigenous um, populations. 
Um, I'd like to close with another finding uh, from the Kerner Commission report. And this, um, actually, before I go there, I didn't mean to, to mention one other thing, um, that, that what we are striving for is equity. And there's a difference between equality and equity. Um, so a good analogy is bicycles. Um, equality means that everyone has a bicycle. And it's the same bicycle, no matter whether you're an adult or a child. But equity means that everybody has a bicycle but the size of the bicycle is proportionate to the need of the individual. So a, a, an adult can have a regular size bicycle, but a child would require a, a smaller bicycle. That's equity. So everyone has the same bicycle, has a bicycle, but it's a bicycle that's appropriate to the needs of the person. Um, so I'd like to close with another observation from the Kerner Commission report, and this is a, a comment that Kenneth Clark, who uh, was a, a distinguished educator and psychologist, made. And referring uh, to reports of earlier riot commissions, he said, I read that report of the 1919 riot in Chicago, and it is, as, it is as if I were reading the report of the Investigating Committee on the Harlem Riot of 35, the report of the investigating committee on the Harlem riot of 43, the report of the McCone Commission of the, on the Watts riot. I must say again in candor to you, it's a kind of Alice in Wonderland with the same moving picture reshown over and over again, the same analysis, the same recommendations, and the same inaction. The problem with this is, uh, as the commission concluded, it's time now to end the destruction and the violence not only in the streets of the ghetto, but in the lives of people. The report provided guidance and direction to end white racism and its effects, but it did not generate the political will necessary to make that happen. Generating that political will now depends on us. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Z. Deeks, for your presentation. You know, very informative. I would like to now, um, hand it over to Dr. Wendy Ellis. Please introduce yourself, Dr. Ellis, and proceed. Good afternoon. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge the first traumas of this nation by honoring the indigenous peoples whose land is now our nation's capital. I'm joining you from Washington, DC, the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, the indigenous tribes of the Anacostia and Potomac River watersheds. So the testimony I'm going to provide today represents my own thoughts and work, and I am not representing nor speaking on behalf of George Washington University. Just want to get that legal part out of the way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen and tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a doctor of public health, and... I have been trained here at George Washington University um, in health policy. Prior to becoming a doctor of public health, I actually had a first career in television news as a producer, worked across the country as well as across the globe with very much an interest, a personal interest in adversity and being able to witness adversity, particularly childhood adversity across the country and again, across the globe. And time and again, seeing many of the stories that I wrote and produced talk about systemic failures, particularly with child abuse and neglect, of systems that are to serve our communities and falling short, whether that is in social service, healthcare, education, policing, even housing. A failure to connect across systems to understand and meet basic needs, basic human needs. And so from that frustration of only telling stories, I decided to roll up my sleeves and actually go back to graduate school and get a master's degree in public health from the University of Washington in Seattle, and then moved to DC to pursue my doctorate in health policy. And along the way, continuing this research to understand what is the driver the root cause of adversity, and why are our systems so disconnected and so unable to be able to reach, to meet, and oftentimes prevent 
the adversities that we see. In addition to having graduate degrees in public health, I've also amassed a few honors around this work that I've been able to do. So I'm a Milken Scholar, inaugural Milken Scholar at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. I'm also an Aspen Institute Ascend Fellow, which lifts up young leaders in the field of two generational strategies to address parental and child development needs. I've been noted for the work that I've developed here at the George Washington University, the Building Community Resilience Process, which I developed in 2017, has been adopted by numerous communities across the country, as well as in seven governmental agencies across the globe. The new Community Resilience Framework, which I unveiled last year and began to implement in five community, county health departments, has now become one of the strategies as public health begins to think about how do we go upstream and address the policies and the systemic drivers of structural racism to foster equity. And some of that work I will share with you today. So this is to give you a little bit of understanding about the widespread adoption of the work that we do. So this is our national network of building community resilience. These are communities across the country, nine states plus the District of Columbia, and we're adding five more states next month with part of the resilience catalyst work that we do with public health. And as you can see by these logos that are here, that not only do we work in blue states or red states, the work that we are doing is bipartisan by nature. It is also multi-sector by nature. And by design, these efforts are multi-racial. Multi you can see there are governmental agencies from the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services to county public health departments, to grassroots organizations, communities, leaders, stakeholders, all coming together to address what Dr. Dietz described as those adverse community environments. Because this is the will that's necessary to address those leaves and branches that are on that parabasis tree. We are in this together, regardless of race, regardless of sector or education. Because as Dr. Dietz said, average childhood experiences are a universal experience in this country. The difference is what you have to bounce back from. Your access to public education, your access to stable housing, those things, those are the elements of resilience. And so while we talk about adverse childhood experiences, I want to begin to lay a script for you to begin to think about, well, how will we respond? And what is the best way to begin to think about undoing the effects of structural racism and the multi-generational impacts that we've seen. So just to round out your understanding of the body of work that I lead at the George Washington University, this is our Center for Community Resilience. I've told you, I've shown you the network, the Building Community Resilience Networks, these national networks of collaboratives, multi-sector, multi-racial, multi-partisan, and the work that we do to help communities define the pair of ACEs for their community and work together to, to foster equity, foster healing, promote resilience. Out of this work, because we are deeply embedded in communities, we've grown to be expert at helping communities speak to and hold space legislative bodies included, such as yours, to hold space around these very difficult conversations with regard to structural racism and inequity. And understanding the connection that if we want to truly foster healing from trauma and prevent that, then we have to hold these spa this space. We have to have these very difficult conversations because only until then are we actually able to get to resilience. And I wanna do a level set here when we talk about resilience. I'm not just talking about helping individuals bounce back after trauma, because we all recognize, particularly in 2020, in the light of this response to this pandemic within a pandemic, 
COVID-19 and social unrest that's been brought about because of social injustices, such as the murder of George Floyd right there in Minnesota. We can't expect individuals to heal and bounce back if where the starting point is was from a place of inequity to begin with. That's why equity is at the center of this work, because that's the only way that we can truly build resilient communities. And a resilient community helps individuals not only bounce back, but it helps them bounce forward. It's providing the supports and net buffers necessary to help them bounce forward and thrive. The public health 3.0 work that we do with Resilience Catalysts, that is work that we do directly with county public health departments. Using public health as those chief health strategists to convene across sectors as well as with community to again get to the root causes of inequity. Working with community to foster healing and build resilience. Oftentimes we find ourselves in conversations such as this with lawmakers because we're no longer just researching and producing more data to make the case around equity and resilience. We are translating in real time what this looks like for policy and the implications for appropriations. How do we take our political will and translate that into real action that is measurable in our communities. And so that is the body of work, and that is why equity is at the center of everything we do. Connecting systems and policies to these community characteristics and population health outcomes that we know are connected to adverse childhood experiences, but also these adverse community environments. Now, I know in previous testimony, you heard from your experts who referred to the adverse community environments as social determinants of health. And not to confuse things, I do want to make it very clear that we move beyond in our work to recognize that these social determinants are actually not very deterministic. And there's nothing social about them. They are systems driven. They are driven by our policies and our practices. And so this work, undoing the effects of structural racism, means that we have to recognize that what's happening to individuals are not by individual choices, but are absolutely driven by policies, policies and practices. So again, just revisiting this tree, I want to reorient you and your thinking about systems and how you can begin to, in your role, begin to address the effects of structural racism. Understanding that the structural racism feeds from the soil, the leaves and the branches on this tree. So when you look at these outcomes and you know the connections to long-term health, you can begin to understand then the policies, the systemic drivers that are behind discrimination, behind community disruption, the lack of opportunity and economic mobility and social capital. These require systems solutions, not programs. We will not program and retrain individuals out of these outcomes. We have to have the will to change from within. Of course, this has been quite evident with COVID-19 and we actually translated the Parabasis tree to help further the point with regard to what does adversity look like? What does it look like at the community level? The preponderance of adversity that has been added on and heaped on to American communities, suburban, rural, urban, and actually the impact has been across all races, but disproportionately so in our communities of color. Disproportionately so in our communities that lack economic mobility. 2020 has shown us that we can no longer keep this secret buried in the soil and unspoken. Structural racism has sprouted in a way that we can no longer just bury. We have to hold space for these conversations. And so our work is to really help 
communities, help lawmakers, help legislators begin to think about the specific policy levers that are at the root of producing racial inequity. I recognize the indigenous people at the beginning of my talk because I think oftentimes our original traumas and the populations that have been, the multiple populations that have been affected by structural racism are overlooked. And it's important, particularly in Minnesota, to remember all communities of color and the history, the long history of our policy that has been absolutely designed for the outcomes that we see. Whether that was the, the systems of oppression and genocide that were inflicted upon Native Americans, to the black codes and Jim Crow laws that restricted access for African Americans and free, newly freed slaves, to the redlining where the evidence of the effects multi-generational effects can be measured today in many of your cities, where you see the racial wealth gap that impacts individuals' access to economic mobility today, that also impacts the quality of schools that individuals have access to, and absolutely informs the differences in community policing that we see in our communities. What I show in front of you is a roadmap of how we got to the inequities that we can measure today by a very deliberate process of policies built upon themselves over the course of 600 years in this, on this continent. This is the work that's before us. These are the levers, the sectors involved in this work. So when we talk about community resilience, then what is it that we should focus on? What should these policies focus on to help us begin to understand how do we undo the effects of these policies and how will we measure this? So this is a close up and as simplified as one can possibly get when you're talking about something as complex as community resilience. But it's important, I think, for this body to begin to understand how will we measure equity? How will we begin to target in our policies, in our appropriations, those things that will make a difference for our communities? So these yellow boxes are actually what we consider stocks. We use systems dynamic modeling in our work to understand how would we measure equity that is driven by policy, practice, and program. And so these yellow boxes are stocks of the community. These are things that help us to understand how are these differences going from race and place-based characteristics of the community. But also, you will notice that some of these things also speak to social determinants. And again, remember, I said at the top of this, this is not about how we ascribe these characteristics to individuals, but understanding that these characteristics are actually outputs and performance indicators of our systems. Home ownership is not just whether or not an individual owns a home, but it's whether you actually, our housing markets and our policies provide a pathway for individuals to own a home. We know that in housing, it is very much, it very much influences the level of economic development that is in a community which then helps us to understand the connection to residents that are employed. And when we connect that over to education, we know because of the way that we fund our, our public schools, that that will then influence the student body composition and the resources that are available to our students. What we've seen in recent years is that also based on the community characteristics, the housing stock, the public school population, there have been differences in how we police our young people, turning schools themselves into a pair of aces, an adverse childhood experience and an adverse community environment. Those things, those policies were driven by criminal justice and law enforcement policies, putting law enforcement in our hallways 
as opposed to access to health and social behavior supports. Being justice involved, whether you're a youth or an adult, we know is connected to outcomes that go right back to the housing policies, go right back to schools and educational attainment. So you can see why we put all three of these together to begin to understand the relationships, that it will not be just one intervention, but we have to think throughout the entire system. So just focusing again on housing and understanding the different contextuals that influence whether we have financing and access to capital for individuals and whether those individuals can afford a home helps us to understand the connection to generational wealth, but also the policies that serve as barriers to accessing that. In the public school realm, again, just zooming out and understanding that connection between how we finance our schools. If we're still using this equality standard, then that's not equity because you can clearly see from district to district and even sometimes within districts, the differences in the physical plant of schools, the quality of teachers that are there. In short, public schools are the huge report card on us putting our money where our mouth is. Mm. And then again, we know, just as I've said, how we police in communities and how we police in schools is fundamentally different based on the income base of that community, as well as the racial composition of that community. And so it's no wonder that you have such differences in contact rates and then incarceration rates in communities of color, because they are fundamentally policed differently. And so when you saw those blue ovals, those help us to understand what are the motivations of our different systems and the policies that we adopt across these different systems, whether that's political interest, racism and discrimination, the demonization of young black men, they all play a part and influence. So it's not just enough to change minds. We have to change these pathways fundamentally through policy. So I shared with you in our briefing packet some of these local data to help you understand how these adversities show up across your state and what they look like and how they come to rest under one roof in one community in one school. And so that helps you to begin to understand at the county level, as, as Dr. Deet said at the beginning, it's not about equality. Some communities fundamentally will need more investment. I have some data that I actually want to point to specifically to make that point. Because while this is a hearing on racial justice, remember, equity can be measured across a number of different ways. And so as we pulled up data to look at what adversity looks like in your state, I think it's important to remember that adversity can be, bur can be a burden regardless of your geography and regardless of your color. Grant, Stevens, Pope, and Traverse counties have some of the highest burdens of adversity in your state. And if one were to just look at the statistics, they would bear out to have many of the same outcomes as your communities of color. And so where we like to draw our differences, oftentimes because of policy, we actually have much more in common. This is why you have to hold space for these equity conversations. Because as the data are bear out, many of these policies that were first intended to impact communities of color in a most oppressive way are having the very same impacts in much of rural America. So again, holding space for these difficult conversations and this reckoning is going to be absolutely important for you as state lawmakers to understand the preponderance of adversity, the incidence of it, 
the differences and how you will measure equity from a systems point of view. So I want to give you just a small roadmap here on how you might think about policies that will begin to address race-based and place-based inequity across your state. In housing, your zoning policies that reinforce the inability for individuals to access economic mobility because of the lack of affordable housing or perhaps because of some of the, the zoning that actually creates more environmental hazards for individuals, lowering the value of their property. And public schools, fundamentally reassessing financing. How we finance our public schools is inherently inequitable and decidedly was purposefully put in place that way. Criminal justice, again, you've seen this on display. Community policing practice must be fundamentally addressed. But at the same time, we also have to think about how are we putting our money in a place where individuals can actually access the supports and buffers they need, whether that's mental health, emotional health, substance abuse treatment. Many of these activities are not the res or should not be the responsibility of law enforcement. And so beginning to think about how we go way upstream to address racial inequities is really important. Now, I've given you the scientific understanding of ACEs and resilience, but I want to tell you a story about why we believe at the Center of Community Resilience that resilience is the answer, and resilience comes from multiple systems. You see, you heard Dr. Dietz talk about the connection between the exposure of ACEs to an increasing risk for all of these negative outcomes. It's important, certainly, to know an ad one's adver adversity or ACEs history. But let us not be fooled that an ACEs score is deterministic. I know this because I know from my own experience. You see, I have an ACEs score of eight. Mm. My father beat my mother every day when she was pregnant with me. How I survived, how she survived, I'll never know. I experience many of those branches that are on that tree, from divorce, from emotional neglect, sexual abuse, discrimination. What I didn't experience was homelessness. What I didn't experience was food insecurity. What I did have access to was safe and stable housing, grandparents who raised me in a community where they felt safe, where they had access to safe jobs, access to the middle class, I had access to quality education from K through 12 with teachers who were, who were compensated for the work that they did, teachers who had the time to care about a child, who it was clear had need for emotional supports. I lived in a community where we had parks and recreation and wonderful programs, swimming, running, playing, just being a child. And the police officers in my neighborhood, they were officer friendly. Because the police officers in my neighborhood knew us, knew our family, knew, our, knew the members of my grandmother's church. You see, that's what community resilience looks like. And no, I didn't live in a utopia. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. But I grew up in a community that invested, invested in the simple pillars of community resilience, access to affordable housing, an opportunity to economic mobility, quality public education, and fair policing practice. So yes, our work is based on the science of average childhood experiences, based on the science of community resilience, but it's also informed by real life. 
that's the challenge that's in front of you. How do you take all of this science? How do you create the will to move forward to finally create an equitable Minnesota? Thank you for this opportunity. Well, well thank you, Dr. Ellis. I think we have been able to take in a lot from both you, Dr. Deese and Dr. Ellis. Um, and it, you know, actually your story, Dr. Ellis, uh, reminds me of the community that I grew up in on the south side of Chicago, right? A community, I probably have aces too, you know. Um, I'm sure I do, right? Most of us do. Um, but it reminds me so much of that community that was a reflection of me, right? That had, you know, uh, schools where teachers uh, looked like me you know, from the principal sometimes that looked like me. When I went to the local store, there was businesses there, owners there who were a reflection of me, right? But it's also the neighborhood from the doctors to the principals to, you know, to those who was on aid and assistance, including my mother at times, you know, but I grew up in a community where we were so connected that we was a support for, for each other. And there was lots of love to go around, even in the midst, even in the midst of. Um, there was place where, I, you know, I spent time with, in the boys and girls clubs, you know, or at Model Cities, where I was able to take crocheting and knitting and learn how to play pool and chess and things like that. And those disinvestments that we now see in our community is a product of a, a lot that we see happening within our community. And you're right, uh, we have a lot to think about as lawmakers. But one of the things that I remember from our last testimony from Dr. Um, gosh, uh, Representative, you're gonna have to help me out here, um, Kamara Jones, who said that racism is a system, not an individual. And so often I have said as a legislator that our disparities exist, not all, but in part because of the policies and practices that we are moving through our legislative body. And so we, you know, it's hard hearing that, right? It could be very, very hard to hear that, you know, because it puts the burdens on us. And so, I would stop there. That's my little journey, right? Um, that's a little bit about me and how I was able to bounce back and to be resilient. And so um, I would like to just open up right now to see if any members have any questions from Dr. Deeks and Dr. Ellis. And yeah, let's just stop there and, and open up for some questions. Okay, let me see. Maybe I need to see if there's any chats going on. Any raised hands? Representative Moran, this is Bill Dietz. While you're looking at that, mm -hmm. I neglected to um, uh, say that um, my testimony were also my thoughts and not representative of George Washington University. Thank you for that. Okay, do we have any questions at all? Any curiosity or? Um, Excuse me. It looks like there was a question from Representative Cagle. Um, yes. Is, um, I tried to respond, wanted... but I felt sure. I didn't want to speak for you. <laughs> right. We would love to come to Minnesota. I was actually there last year. Two of your health departments invited me to talk about the BCR work. Um, but it's not on the list for 2020. Um, but let's keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. And you must have some experience with German last names because nobody ever pronounces it right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you got it right. It's a press. All right. So, okay. Oh, Representative Erdolf. We can't hear you, so.
We're not able to hear you, Representative Erdoff. I think he's on mute. Are you on, you're on mute, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Again. There you go. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. All right, great. Or maybe not, depends on your point of view. <laughs> Good to hear uh, you. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Ellis, uh, just wanted to, to comment that uh, don't, in Minnesota, uh, we have a formula system for education, so all of our uh, schools receive the same amount uh, per student, uh, no matter where they live in the state. Uh, then we have uh, what are called categoricals, which add on uh, funding for each school, depending on particular um, situations that they have, uh, like uh, how many uh, uh, English as a second language uh, and uh, various other categories. And so th this is how we fund our schools here. Uh, but we still uh, have a, a growing um, achievement gap. It's been a persistent problem in Minnesota between minority students and white students. And I, I wonder if you have um, any insight into uh, what we should look at regarding that situation here in Minnesota. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Question. Ellis. Yes. Thank you for that question, um, Representative Ertl. Um, one of the things I think, you know, I would, I would certainly say that you're on the right path with regard to thinking about, you know, how you offset the equality and get closer to equity. There are a number of other factors though that um, will stymie you if you're only looking at it through the lens of education. And so many of these students, we have to think about, you know, what is the home environment like to support, um, you know, learning? So are, are we providing living wages for parents? Are parents able to actually spend the time, quality time with their child to read? I mean, we know that parental engagement is a huge factor in closing the word gap with children, but also where there is a, additional stressors in that household, that will deteriorate the ability for, for parents to be engaged in their, in their child's education. And so safe, stable housing, food, um, food security uh, also, but the community environment itself. And so this is where I was speaking to um, from the model of community resilience, understanding that we have to think about the, the entire environment that a child is in. It's not enough to just address the, the seven or six hours that a child might be in school, but we have to think about the environment of which we are releasing our children into. And so that's where I think, you know, looking at where are the investments in, from a state perspective and making sure that families are supported, not just the child's education, but families are supported. One of the other things though that you could also look at, and I'm not quite sure um, from a Minnesota perspective with regard to education is, are you the funding, do you have universal pre-K? Um, you do, okay. Um, is it all day? No, not quite, no, not quite universal. I'm sorry? I say I don't think it's quite universal pre-K. Not we universal. We have vouchers, we do have some scholarships, um, but not so much universal. That is also one of the effective strategies, making sure that we're getting to children younger um, and, and with much more consistency than what we've seen across many of the states. And so that would be, if you were looking for further investments in education, that's certainly one of the areas to go. But I would also strongly urge you to think about how are we supporting children in the context of their families and those families in the context of communities that promote um, learning. And so um, I'm not the expert here on education, but what I, I definitely agree with, with Dr. Ellis, but I would also like to just state, which has been a concern of mine, is that when we give every school across the state of Minnesota equal amount of money, that one within itself is not equity. There are some, if we're looking at educational outcomes of, of, of kids, and for me, it's like we want to work to ensure that every child from pre-K to 12th grade have access to a quality, a great quality education. And there are some schools that are just highly, highly underfunded that do not have the resources that maybe a school in Edina or other schools who have resources. Because fundamentally, we are, schools have been funded by property tax, taxes. So that equity, that systemic inequity is, is inequitable. 
And so if we're looking at ensuring that every child has a quality, a good quality education, who, who is doing well, every school, in my mind, do not need the same amount of funding to ensure great outcomes for every school within that school system. And so I think funda fundamentally for me, how we are funding school is hugely inequitable. Uh, and I really have something we truly have to work on because we have some great schools. You go into those great schools and they have like, you know, banks and uh, 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 coffee shops and, you know, some of the greatest white boards. And that is awesome. There is nothing bad about that. That is awesome. But there are some others that don't even have a Chromebook, right, or access to. And so if it's about racial equity, so if it's about equities, if it's about looking at the adverse childhood experiences, then I, I think we have more work that we can do to create access to good quality education across the state of Minnesota. Can I um, um, just add to that Ellis? comment? Yeah, okay. can I just add to that? And so this is where I was talking about with regard to thinking about the other investments that are needed. So it is not just about the per pupil spending, but it's also those services that we invest in to support these children. If we recognize that there are going to be different traumas and probably a higher burden of adversity that that is crossing the threshold and coming into that classroom every day, then we need to make sure that we have, we're actually investing in the skill sets for the individuals that are in that building to serve those children. So maybe some of our other, the other schools where they are not facing the same level of adversity don't need as many support services um, than some of the students that are in, in those populations that are carrying the burden. You were using, I think Representative Erdahl used the um, metric of the number of children with English as a second language. That could be a proxy but there are other uh, measures that we would wanna look at and really match the needs of the community. These formulas are not gonna help us to address the adversities across the board for all of our children. So we have to make sure that we are looking at that school community, that district community, and, and providing the absolute supports, whether those are monetary or resources that are needed to help close the gap for our children. There is no one size fits all solution. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Representative Hur. Uh, thank you, Representative Moran. Uh, and this question can be for Dr. Ellis or Dr. Um, is it Dietz? Dietz. Dietz. Is it Dietz? Um, so I just had a quick, two things really quick to touch on because my original question had to do with, um, you know, I've been investing a lot these last few years in trying to understand um, brain development and um, the physical changes in the brain due to trauma and some of the effects that, you know, and uh, some of these ACEs effects. And I was just curious as to if you've seen any states be really successful at trying to address uh, ACEs uh, from birth. Uh, and because we sort of know some of these environments exist before a child even comes into those spaces, right? And so are there any states that actually, um, you know, support programs or initiatives that actually address this much earlier on than waiting until kids are in school and trying to address the disparities or the gaps there? And then the other question is, um, you know, with the in St. Paul, our our highest um, population of student is uh, is uh, it's like thirty, it's like thirty six percent Asian, thirty three percent African American, um, and so the demographics is a little bit different than most urban cores. But a lot of our Asian community have uh, their immigrants and refugees, and there's so much trauma that comes with those things that I think sometimes we don't catch. Like if if some of those cases don't occur in the current household now. It doesn't really look at the past trauma, just like, you know, a lot of our African-American students are carrying historical trauma with them, right? But like some of the things we're looking at deals with the current existing environment that they are in. Is there any kind of work or research that you can sort of direct us to in really understanding historical trauma and like trauma that is experienced by families before they even get to the environment in which we're trying to address to help our children be successful and their families to be successful? Okay, Dr. Ellis or Dr. Deese. If one of you would like to respond to that. I know I see um, Lindsay McMurrin uh, just shaking her head. She's ready to do this. But I'm going to let you speak and present, and maybe you can we'll follow up once you present, uh, Lindsay. Okay. 
So I, I can certainly get um, back to you about work that's being done at the state level because I don't know of a state off the top of my head, but I do know about some initiatives that have been led by child health systems specifically to do early identification and intervention. One of them is um, Vital Village in Boston, which is, oh, I can't remember Renee's um, last name, but um, African-American pediatrician who has worked very deeply in community um, and with families to identify exposure to ACEs, both, and she again uses a two-gen approach. So this is, um, you know, thinking about not only the parents' ACE history, but then what are the traumas that, um, you know, perhaps the child or the stressors that the child has been exposed to, and really do that within the pediatric practice, but expanding that out to the community, creating these peer-to-peer -peer supports, um, and making sure that families are connected to the resources, whether those are clinical, social services, or other supports that they're needed to offset that early exposure to trauma, but then also prevent the, that cycle of trauma for the child. So the, typically those, those children are, you know, birth to 18 years old in the practice, but that is one model of providing, you know, the early identification and intervention. And there are a number of different models that have been adopted by child health systems and other um, intervention networks. In fact, one of the our BCR partners in Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Beach Acres, they have actually created this Parent Connects where you have parent coaches that are embedded in a pediatric practice that begin to identify stressors that could lead to chronic stress or um, you know, some other adverse complexity for the child and the family, and then use these peer-to-peer -peer supports to begin to connect families to the resources that they need. So those, there, there are community-based models, there are practice-based models. I have not seen that yet translated to the state level to begin to think about how we would knit these resources together. And, and this is the work of our state legislators that we actually need that help to reduce, to remove the barriers for these different sectors to be able to do this collaborative work because it's absolutely necessary to be able to address not just the emotional, emotional and physical needs, but also when we're thinking about it from a community perspective, that's why I presented to you the ecosystem to begin to think about the multiple systems and providers that will be necessary to, to do the early identification, but also address those needs. And I think that's where you have an opportunity there in the state legislature. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, let's see here, Representative Cable. Um, thank you, Chair Moran. And I guess my question is um, how um, our cur current circumstances, um, especially COVID, have affected some of these early IDs and, uh, and interventions. I used to work at a community action agency that did um, Head Start programming and just doing a quick web search, you know, their class sizes are reduced. And so we're not serving as many kids as we used to. Um, and so I'm just kind of worried about how that will affect, um, affect this going forward as well. I, I think I think there's a large concern. I mean, reason for concern here um, due to COVID. You know, you think about the fact that our children have not had the opportunity to be in the congregate classrooms. Um, that you know, the nurse family um, practitioners have not been able to do the home visiting that's necessary. Um, when you think about the other eyeballs that are on our children day to day, um, to not only monitor how well they're doing, but also intercede in, a, in an earlier point when there is adversity. Those things have been gone because we've all had to be in lockdown and separated from one another. What I have seen is an increased reliance and, and thankfully some of the barriers um, around telehealth and particularly using telehealth for nurse for the nurse family practitioners programs. I think those are wonderful that at least um, you know we're able to see and have some contact with families in that way. But COVID has also you know limited the ability for individuals to be able to do that because not all families have access to to Wi-Fi, high-speed internet, or have the um, the um, the technology to be able to facilitate those meetings. And as you know, Representative Moran, when you were talking about earlier about the education on word gap, you know, we will be paying for some time for the effects of COVID-19, not just in death and not just in the economy, but certainly in education. 
There are many children who were starting from behind that have fallen even further behind because of the lack of access to technology. We've had to make some very tough, difficult choices about whether we continue to keep our kids at home uh, or face the risk of them being exposed to this unseen virus. Um, but what we will be paying for beyond the economic cost is the educational delays that are inevitable because so many of the children that are at highest risk for lower educational attainment are falling farther behind because of the lack of our investment in infrastructure, whether that is the access, the digital divide, and this is happening in urban and particularly in our urban com our rural communities as well. The, the lack of access to high-speed internet, the lack of access to the technology to close that education gap. So I, you know, while I've seen some promising practices um, being adopted and quickly adopted, and I think, you know, when you think about this from a state legislature perspective, perhaps you be, could look at how we so rapidly expanded access in this time of emergency and perhaps look at that as a model to move forward. But I think, again, COVID-19 just laid bare some of those inequities that have been there for some time and only exacerbated them and the solution, the repair is going to be um, something that is going to require much attention when we come out of this. So I'm, <clears throat> I would just like to add to Wendy's comments that, that I think we can anticipate an increase in adverse childhood experiences as a consequence of the, of the pandemic. Um, because I, we know that unemployment has increased. We know that uh, substance abuse has increased. We know that family violence has increased. All of these are, are translated down to uh, to the children in those families. And as Wendy has, has so correctly pointed out, our ability to <clears throat> respond is limited because we don't have access to those children. Um, pediatric examinations are down uh, and, and the caretakers, which would uh, in schools, the teachers who would normally uh, make that assessment are not seeing children um, eyeball to eyeball. All right, thank you, Dr. Dietz. Uh, Representative Sandell. Thank you, Chair Moran and uh, Dr. Dietz and uh, Dr. Ellis. I um, uh, appreciate the information today and thought it was um, uh, fascinating and um, particularly disheartening. Last week we saw similar information, but I have to say that the incidence of, of poverty and racial uh, um, discrimination um, isn't surprising, and the uh, uh, the associated situations that children and their families face uh, uh, isn't surprising either. The policy proposals that uh, everybody on the screen and uh, and the uh, experts that we've had a chance to listen to are uh, are interesting and and uh, um, and positive, um, but I'll tell you, I just don't see the political will to um, uh, approach any of these things. And the the the, the, the examples you were talking about as far as children are concerned, I'm a former teacher and uh, I, I anticipated the situation that uh, kids are having uh, um, in, in school these days with the limited access to uh, um, uh, to uh, direction at home maybe and, and certainly uh, technology. Front page story in the New York Times today, a big story in New Yorker yesterday, the Brookings Institution full of stories about uh, uh, children falling behind in school districts not being able to sue to uh, provide the opportunities to kids who uh, are eventually, um, we hope, become independent citizens, but they aren't going to if the, if the education and their health care is not there. Where is this political will to um, step forward, uh, assume the costs, and um, take action in a bipartisan or multipartisan way to uh, uh, approach the, the really uh, um, uh, daunting issues that we have in front of us? Um. Thank you. Dr. Dietz. Thank you, Representative Sandel. Um, so one of the things that concerns me the most is the, the fracture that's occurred in our uh, political environment. And um, uh, uh, Gary Gunderson, who's a pastor at Wake Forest University, says that change moves at the speed of trust and trust moves at the speed of relationships. Yeah. And it's that kind of fundamental building of trust and building of relationships um, that hopefully uh, has already started in this committee, but, but needs to spread more broadly if we're gonna make the kind of 
of changes that need to be made to address the, the, the crisis that we're in. Yes, trust and relationships are very important. Um, I think I have a question here from Representative Edelson that says, are there communities or states that you think are doing a good job on tackling systems? I had it. Yes, I had acknowledged that question um, in in my earlier answer, and just saying that you know, off the top of my head, I don't know of states that have done this effectively across sectors. Certainly, I can go back to our policy lab and um, you know look at more evidence and share that with this committee afterwards. But that, I think this is why it's really important for us to look at some of those examples that I did speak to at the community and organizational level that could have potential for scaling up at the state level. And we will share those with you. I think, you know, when we talk about trauma-informed policies and practices, one of the states that I've been a little bit in, been impressed with is California, who has looked at trauma-informed policies and practices, and whereas they looked at the, within the criminal justice system. They looked at um, uh, youth corrections, and um, that was tied to um, the criminal justice, was yeah, tied to the criminal justice system. And so they removed that youth corrections out of that system and put it under health and human services. And I just think, you know, we look at young people, look at youth and the trauma they have experienced and because of the trauma they have experienced, uh, how their behavior shows up and, you know, out in the community and say, you know, instead of incarcerating our youth, we're going to look at how we can place them under health and human services and provide them with the resources they need versus incarceration. And I know also with the fires that's going on uh, across California, they are now utilizing prisoners to help with the fires. And the governor just, I think he moved maybe an executive order that says that once these individuals are released from prison, that that criminal record would not prevent them from going to being a firefighter. And so those type of pathways and looking in, 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 um, in uh, system changes really creates Healthier, healthier and stronger communities if we can look at it through those type of lens. And so um, uh, I know when I was doing some work around trauma informed policies, it's, that's what I found that was going on in California that I thought that maybe we can try to replicate here in the state of Minnesota if we were more informed around uh, trauma informed uh, policies and practices. Well, and ACES, right? Because you have to be informed about every salad experiences to even have a lens to see the possibility of what trauma does and how trauma shows up. Um, so that has been uh, informational for me. Um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Ellis, you talked about looking at education, but also looking at housing and, you know, public safety. You know, you use the word criminal justice, but I think we can look at that two different ways and probably think of two different outcomes, whether we're going to call it public safety or criminal justice, right? And so, you know, recognizing that words matter too, that words um, will help us with our thought process and how we see um, a situation or solutions or problems. Um, may, I, may I add a just- Dr. Um, Ellis. Yes, um, Representative Moran, you brought up something that I think is really important and actually ties back to what Rep Representative Sandal was saying with regard to um, the pushback from others in the community. Um, and that's around being trauma informed. Um, I often bristle when I hear the term being trauma informed or we've been trauma informed certified or you know, we're a trauma informed organization because um, oftentimes there's yes, an, an, a recognition of adversity and trauma experienced by individuals except for racism. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna tackle racism. 
even though that's the, the original right. trauma inflicted in this country. And it's the underpinning of so many of the adversities that we see. And so, Representative Sandal, when you were talking about, I just don't see how we can have a pathway to moving forward, that is the work that is at the heart of, you know, this, the building community resilience work that we do, but also at the center is, as Bill said, you're not going to move forward without building relationships and you're not going to get to trust without those relationships. And that's fundamental. The reason why I show you the policy timeline is to help you recognize, although we might intellectually understand that we're talking about hundreds of years of policy, we're all adult learners. When you see it, that reinforces the point. And the point is, is that we are building relationships and we are building trust to build the will to not just change something in this, in this session, but to build the foundation so that we can have the will to change it. And perhaps it will all change much after we have been here, but we have to start today um, in order to get to tomorrow's solution. Um, we didn't get here overnight. That's another tool. And the reason why we use that timeline is to help people understand the enormity of what is before us. But I will say there is nothing more important than the trauma that is suffered today. And if right. we have an opportunity to, to prevent trauma being um, felt and inflicted on our communities tomorrow, then we start today. Well, thank you, Dr. Um, Ellis, for bringing us back to the foundation of why this committee is here, uh, which is to um, unpack racism, systemic racism, and how we as, um, as a body can move forward with some good you know, hopefully, and we'll see how this works, you know, some recommendations that we can uh, share at the end of uh, these hearings that will help move our state forward in a way that we feel comfortable at the minimum just talking about racism and, and recognizing it. So with that, um, if you can, you can stay on. There may be some other questions that may come before us. If you cannot, uh, we understand. I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deese and Dr. Ellis, for, for your testimony. It has been really informative, and um, I hope that we have been able to receive some good information that we can move forward with and take forward. Uh, with that, I would like to take this time to um, introduce uh, Lindsay. Uh, McMurray. You know, I'm not going to introduce you, McMurray. I'm going to acknowledge you and hope that you can uh, introduce yourself mm -hmm. and then uh, proceed with your testimony. Miigwech. Thank you, Representative Moran. Buju, Gawin Apaji Ninata, Anishinaabe Mosi, Ninga Kugejatun Ji, Anishinaabe Moyan, Ninlinzi Indijinakaz, Jaganashi Mang. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for providing me with the honor of being here with all of you today. My name is Lindsay McMurrin. I am a citizen of the Leech Lake Nation of Ojibwe, and I live in the Walker area in northern Minnesota on the beautiful shores of Leech Lake. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you, and I've been listening um, quite anxiously to the conversations happening. Um, uh, following uh, Dr. Dietz and Dr. Ellis's uh, testimony, I uh, look forward to bringing uh, the connections uh, of current work happening here in Minnesota. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, uh, we've been doing this work uh, as the organizations I represent since 2013. Um, and it, uh, so I'm really excited to make some of those connections for you as to all the good work that's already happening in our state around this work. As I mentioned before, I'm a citizen of the Leech Lake Nation of Ojibwe, born and raised in northern Minnesota. Um, I'm a mother. I'm a mother to four. Um, we have a blended family. So two of those babies grew in my belly. Two of them grew in my heart. Um, and I mentioned the, these uh, additional details about me because part of what we this work is really about is um, understanding one another, connecting with one another. Um, and I'm here today as an Indigenous woman, um, certainly speaking on the issues that I see that are impacting my communities, but I am speaking um, as Lindsay, um, and, you know, with the, the wealth of experience and knowledge that I've gained through, through living life and being a lifelong resident uh, of Northern Minnesota. Um, uh, in terms of, of the work that I do, um, I am a certified uh, master trainer with the ACE Interface Curriculum. 
which is the, the curriculum put forth by uh, one of the original co-principal uh, investigators of the original ACE study, Dr. Rob Anda, um, along with Laura Porter out of Washington State. Um, my organization, um, formerly known as Minnesota Communities Caring for Children, uh, Home of Prevent Child Abuse Minnesota, we, as of July 1st, we merged with Family Wise Services. Um, we're excited to be able to offer a continuum of care now, being that our organization um, has really been focused on prevention and upstream uh, ways of building healthy, thriving communities and families that will support the, uh, our children uh, in the, all those healthy outcomes we want to see. And now we combine that with family-wise services programs that are focused on intervention, on, on the downstream impact of um, ACEs of the, the racial equity work that, that remains to be done in our, our state. Um, and so we are very happy to marry the, our, our services, right? So to being able to provide the upstream approach and talking about prevention and the importance of preventing child abuse and neglect by focusing on skill building, um, empowering families, understanding that parents um, are, uh, are, are we need to recognize uh, the leadership that they bring to the table, the experiences, the understanding, um, the true lived experiences, um, as well as being able then to create that continuum of support within the community um, that has been mentioned time and again um, by our, our previous presenters. As an indigenous woman, it's incredibly important to me um, to name my purpose uh, in being here today and my purpose in the work that I do. It's truly really something I feel like I've been called to. Uh, I uh, appreciated uh, Representative Richardson's words at the beginning regarding that paradigm shift that takes place when you begin to learn more about adverse childhood experiences, historical trauma, intergenerational adversity, right? And it's shifting from that question of what's wrong with you and instead to what's happened, right? What's happened that is impacting um, the behaviors that we see that we don't understand, um, the ongoing inequities and disproportionalities across the board in our BIPOC communities here in Minnesota when it comes to issues of education, to health care, to um, involvement in criminal justice systems, um, you know, across the board. Uh, as I appreciated, it, it was pointed out by Representative Sandell as well, this is hard work. Um, and the question that was posed is how do we get there? Um, especially with the growing divide around these types of conversations. And to that, I want to say, uh, we must know the exact nature of the problem if we are to effectively address it. And here in Minnesota, um, you know, I spent a lot of time researching, researching um, for my testimony today, and I came up with pages upon pages of data about the disproportionality in terms of how our Indigenous communities are impacted. You know, we read those words on a page, but how often do we stop to think about how that feels? What that's doing within us. Um, we know that the main um, cause of a lot of these health disparities that we're seeing rests around that impact of toxic stress, that uh, prolonged toxic stress on our bodies and on our systems. And, you know, those biological adaptations that are made when you're constantly on high alert looking for the next danger around the corner. This is my daily life. This is the thing that I think about. This is what I think about with my children, right? Um, about their safety uh, as um, boys, my two littlest are two boys with brown skin walking around on the street. And we think a lot about urban locations in Minnesota in terms of where we really see that blatant uh, racism and discrimination. However, I live a short 30 minutes away from Bemidji. Um, Bemidji is, um, has been plagued since its inception with uh, racial disparities and discrimination. You know, it is a city that um, is very much supported by economically the three large tribal nations that surround it of Leech Lake, Red Lake and White Earth. Yet it remains a hotbed of racial discrimination, um, both through, um, you know, day-to-day -day personal interactions with folks, as well as being instituted um, through policies um, and laws and ways of doing and being coming from the leaders of the area that are not supportive of what our communities need. Now, I know that the shortest um, distance between two people is a story. And with that in mind today, what I want to bring to you is three stories that have been shared with me 
in my work um, across Minnesota. So I mentioned previously that I work for an organization, uh, Family Wise Services, um, that is Home of Prevent Child Abuse Minnesota. Um, under our former uh, name, Minnesota Communities Caring for Children, we've been doing this work since about 2013, uh, rep uh, supported by uh, Representative Moran, as well as many others who have recognized the importance of talking about ACEs when we start to look at the disparities in particular we're looking at in terms of um, uh, ch child welfare, um, you know, child abuse and neglect rates um, within our communities. One of the main shifts that we took in, in the way that we do our work is instead of taking a punitive approach in which we think about only punishing the parents who, who fall into these situations, we took a step back to really look again at the nature of the problem and recognizing that there are root causes that's creating these types of environments that um, lead to that accumulation of stressors on a parent, on a, a caregiver, that may then result in these types of situations where our children aren't safe. Um, but we wanted to take a step back, right? Look at the root causes and also to look at what was it that the parents are lacking uh, in terms of support, in terms of um, knowledge and understanding and skill sets that will then allow these parents to have everything that they need, uh, as well as, you know, healthy coping mechanisms um, to be able to be the most effective parents that they can be for their children um, to, to prevent um, the situations in which um, child abuse and neglect take place, um, you know, so moving upstream in that approach. And something that became very evident to us in this work was how important these conversations around adverse childhood experiences, uh, as well as a number of other factors are to really being able to understand the nature of the problem. So at our organization, we use the framework of near science, it brings together the brain science, right, the neuroscience, epigenetics that weaves in historical trauma, um, as well as that ongoing impact of epigenetic inheritance uh, and intergenerational adversity. Then of course we talk about ACEs, but it isn't the main focus because there's so much more going on. And so I so appreciate the perspectives of Dr. Ellis and Dr. Dietz and realizing that uh, if we only focus on the adverse childhood experience piece, we're missing the environments, um, which are, are um, um, uh, continuing to perpetuate um, these intergenerational cycles of adversity and harm. So that being said, um, let me back up just a moment and, and to, to give you uh, an idea of the reach that we have had been able to have here in Minnesota. Our um, process includes bringing in um, children's mental health collaboratives and family service collaboratives across the state um, as being our springboard into community. And through that process, um, we have over 50 collaboratives actively participating with 65 total um, opted in. Um, since 2013, we have reached over 20,000 people across the state of Minnesota with this information around ACEs uh, and the near science approach. And in addition, we've trained in over 800 presenters um, to go out and to continue to build capacity within the communities and to continue to spread this knowledge throughout uh, our communities across the state. Of that, um, I am the director of the tri tribal projects uh, and prevention initiatives for family wise services. And we have a tribal near science and community wisdom project um, that specifically is working with five out of our 11 tribal nations right now here in the state of Minnesota to address um, the issues that our communities are seeing. And within that project itself, we have reached um, we've trained in over 150 uh, presenters, many of them Indigenous themselves, to be able to bring this back into our communities to speak to it in a way that is culturally responsive and culturally respectful. Um, we have been able to have a number of conversations in each of our tribal communities we're working in to really um, live out the fact that we believe that those most impacted must be driving the solutions. Now, that being said, that does not mean that that responsibility, the onus for the work all rests on our shoulders, right? But one of the things that um, has not been done in a good way is to really um, uncover uh, the struggles of our communities with our community voice. Oftentimes the narrative is built by others um, in a really uh, paternalistic way. And so part of our tribal project work is really um, empowering communities uh, and really lifting up the community wisdom and traditional knowledge that is such a, a treasure, such a, a, a value 
um, that we have to offer in our indigenous communities. So that being said, I wanna to get to the stories. I wanna to get to the part um, that to me is most impactful. So as an Ojibwe woman, I just want to recognize and acknowledge how storytelling is an important uh, art form, uh, you know, oral tradition in our communities. And not only that, but it has always served as a conduit, pass along cultural teachings and knowledge. Um, and so today it is my honor to share with you stories that have been shared with me as I work across the state of Minnesota in our tribal communities and beyond, um, talking about this work and really um, asking the community for the solutions that, that mean the most to them. First story I'd like to share is of an elder I met when I was over at uh, on that White Earth Nation. Um, I was in Pine Point. We had come together, come there. Um, White Earth is one of the communities, tribal communities, that was the first early adopter of this work along with us. Um, there's really been traction there, particularly in their early childhood departments of recognizing the importance of this work um, for their community. So we had come together to do a community presentation. So um, much like what Dr. Dietz and Dr. Ellis talked about today, um, we utilize a, a different curriculum, uh, ACE Interface, to be able to talk to communities about the basics around these topics. So we had organized that. Um, tribal communities, uh, food is always a, a draw. Uh, let's face it, for all of us in Minnesota, right? Food is always a draw to our gatherings. So we had prepared a dinner. Um, we had gotten childcare set up. We were in um, kind of a rural uh, community there in White Earth at Pine Point. And we thought we had all of our boxes checked in terms of, you know, community organizing. Unfortunately, what ended up happening was that there was something else exciting happening <laughs> on, the, on the reservation that day that conflicted with our event. And we only ended up with one gentleman attending our, our, our presentation. Now, this elder um, listened with curiosity, leaned in, asked questions. And the most impactful story um, that I can think of in, in going around and doing this work took place after our presentation was finished. He uh, approached me and my colleague and really earnestly just said, you know, it's like a light bulb went on. You know, and we leaned back to listen to, to the rest of the wisdom he's going to share with us. You know, and he talked about his own family story. He talked about how he wishes that his daughter, who at the present moment had been struggling with active um, substance abuse issues, he wished that she would have been there with him to hear um, the information that we brought forth. He talked about his own experience as a recovering alcoholic who had been man maintaining sobriety and in fact at this point was taking care of both grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, as he watched other family members struggle. He talked about watching that cycle repeat in his family. He talked about how difficult it was to know that the same thing that he went through as a young person was the same cycle then that his daughter was subjected to. Now, by this point, right, he had become an elder. He had, had done his own healing work, his own journey, right? And so he was in recovery. He was um, living, you know, in a good way, and he was taking care of, of kids and grandkids grandkids and grand great grandchildren because of that. But what he said was that the information that we talked about, this near science approach, right? Laying out all of the science, Western science, Western ways of knowing around this and marrying that with a culturally specific, culturally responsive way of talking about this work. Um, he said it helped him understand why he did the things he, that he did, even then, even when he knew the results that were to come out of it, right? So he talked a lot about how this work <laughs> empowered him, that shame, that guilt, that blame that oftentimes plagues us um, from dealing with the exact nature of the problem had in a way um, been, been dropped to a certain extent by realizing that these are intergenerational cycles, that there is a root cause to many of the issues we're seeing. And by no means please don't take this the wrong way. What we also realize is that there is personal responsibility in it. And this elder, this elder was the first to say that. He said, you know, I realize that I have made choices too that have led us to where we are now. He said, however, he said, I know, I, and he started to present this big long list of people that we needed to go talk to. Because he said, if you start spreading this information across our communities, it is empowering, 
right? Because what we've been taught as Indigenous people is that we're inferior. It's what our systems say. It's what policy say. It's what the explicit government policy told us um, for quite some time. So really understanding the exact nature of the injury um, and the healing that needs to take place uh, within individuals across our community is such um, so key to being effective in this work. Oftentimes we treat people's coping mechanism as the problem, right? When in fact, we would be much more effective if we took the time to address the root causes behind the issues and behaviors that we're seeing. As Dr. Rob Anda, co-principal investigator of the original ACE study pointed out, he says, what's predictable is preventable. And for me, as I go out into my tribal communities and do this work, I would not do it if I did not bring with it hope-filled action. Um, so often our communities, our tribal communities in particular, have well-meaning folks coming in from the outside telling us what we need to do. Often with a very paternalistic, um, whitewashed uh, image of what that needs to be. It doesn't take into a to account the collective nature of our, our uh, traditions, of, of who we are as a people, of how our cultures operate. Um, and it doesn't take into account, um, again, the root causes of issues we're seeing today, which is very much rooted in the historical traumas perpetuated against us as Indigenous people. What we need to realize is that those same policies, those same um, ideologies that were in place when we went through the boarding school era with the kill the Indian, save the man mentality. Um, while those were deeply embedded within those institutions and systems, um, and that while the blatant racism and discrimination part of it perhaps has been removed, many of our systems and institutions are still built upon those frameworks, okay? And so the next story that I do wanna share gets at that educational piece um, in a particular way. So in community doing this work, I've had the opportunity to really sit and listen to what communities are asking for. Uh, right here in my home community of Leech Lake, um, we, I was working with community um, talking about these concepts. And one of the things that rose to the surface right away, um, as I looked around at the, the elders you know, in our circle, there were a lot of women, um, some younger women as well, and one of the first things that someone stood up and said was, where are all the men? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they part of these conversations? You know, being a protector um, is a big part of, of, of um, a point of pride for, for many of the men in our community. However, because of the distortions of um, mainstream society, we often think that means, you know, coming with, with fists raised, with that, that physical display of, of of power and protection. However, what um, the women in my circle were getting at was how, yes, they are our protectors, but to be our protectors, it means to understand these concepts that we're talking about, to understand what's going on within our bodies and minds when we're confronted with danger or conflict or trauma, and to be skilled enough to know the right ways in the right environment in order to, to, to meet the needs, um, to, to be that, to maintain the role of a protector. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because an idea came out of that. And this, so this community asked if we could have a men's four on four basketball tournament. So keep in mind, I'm coming into the community to talk about adverse childhood experiences and community resilience. And I'm so thankful for, uh, for um, people in our corner uh, funders who understand the nature of community work because it was an easy sell actually to go back to my funders and say, this is what our community wants to do. And what I see it doing is promoting a positive way for, for um, community members to come together, an opportunity for learning, right? Because we have presentations and content delivered at that same time, as well you know, as a point of pride um, for community gathering. Now, all that to say, what happened at that event um, was pretty uh, remarkable. I had a, a number of young people attend the presentation portion. So in addition to playing basketball, right? I was sitting over in a room next door offering free gas cards as an incentive for anybody who was coming, willing to come and listen to the topics that, that I wanted to bring forth. We had such great response in terms of, of folks coming in and filling the rooms uh, at times that when they weren't on the floor playing. 
And what emerged out of that also was another story I'd like to share with you today. There was a young man um, who currently was a, a high schooler at the, the local high school. Um, and after learning more about stress response, learning more about what happens when our bodies are currently constantly being impacted by toxic stress, um, when we're constantly on high alert, set on high alert around um, looking for the next danger around the corner, this young man sat back and looked really thoughtful. And I could tell he needed to say something. And so I asked him, I said, you know, what's on your mind after seeing that? He said, it all makes sense now. He said, I struggle so much with my anger. I struggle so much with discipline issues at school. I get in trouble even when I'm trying not to. Now, I had a longer conversation with this young man. We talked about stressors in his life. We talked about a window of tolerance, right? So you guys know that idea that depending upon what else we have going on in life, sometimes our window of tolerance, right, shrinks. Sometimes it's larger. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be a 16-year-old boy who constantly is dealing, in his words, with the, the death of friends, cousins, classmates, almost weekly? Uh, he talked about uh, you know, those continued stressors. And he asked me this question, how can I be expected to focus on school when I'm in an almost constant state of mourning? You know, and that speaks very truly to what many of our young people experience uh, in our tribal communities. We're attending wakes and uh, funeral services on a, a weekly basis. And it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't our elders who've lo lived long and good lives. It's our young people. Um, to bring up some of the data, I know that uh, Representative Erdahl pointed out earlier, the disproportionality in terms of our achievement gaps in Minnesota. You know, in 2019, it was called a state, it was finally named a statewide crisis. Uh, Minnesota has some of the largest achievement gaps by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status in the entire nation. Um, so often, too, um, we see that reflected in the disparities in, in discipline. And this is another um, part of what this young man was telling me about. You know, he said, you know, no matter what I do, you know, I, it always gets bigger than it, it needed to be. He said, I always ended up getting sent to the principal's office or getting kicked out of school. So what is it when our young people go into this environment where they're supposed to find safety? They're supposed to find connection. And we know that safety plus connection often equals learning. But what happens when those things aren't present? What happens when our young people are being told, you don't belong here either? That's what's happening here in Minnesota. That's what's happening in the schools that, that I attended, that I am sending my children to. Uh, this young man, the school he is attending, um, had these issues as well. You know, in Minnesota, uh, Black students are eight times more likely to be suspended or expelled, and Indigenous students are 10 times more likely to be suspended or expelled mm -hmm. than a white student. Um, you know, we know that there's there's work going on to address th those issues. The Minnesota Department of Human Rights and Minnesota Department of Education has been working to reduce those disparities through st strategic planning and data collection. They formed agreements, right, with many of the schools that were flagged for having these disparities. However, what I would like to note is that this school, in particular, that this young man um, attended, is one of the schools that opted out and said, "No, we don't have a problem here." And so what I would suggest to all of you, as you think about what we can do at the policy level, there's no reason why every school in our state should not have an agreement that clearly lays out what they will do in order to address these issues with disparities and uh, disparities in discipline uh, among our bike POC communities across the state. Um, Ms. McMurray, you know, yeah. Ms. McMurray. We have it's 2.48 and I, I want to make sure if folks have questions that they can ask you questions before we adjourn. Okay. Three. Sounds so good. I'll, you want to I'll, wrap it yep. up? Or? Thank you. Um, you know, we know the correlation again, then the school to prison pipeline, uh, you know, as of July, 2020, our American Indians uh, population made up 8.2% of the prison population, despite only accounting for 1.1% of the population in Minnesota. The correlation is clear here. Uh, this young man and his story that he shared with me, you know, I keep getting in trouble even when I try not to. We can't ignore that. Um, he is one, but one student, but he represents many of the stories that I've heard shared across our state. 
both from our indigenous young people as well as black students of color. Uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier about immigrant and refugee communities. Um, we really need to take a deep look at this. If our students can see it happening and can point it out and know the exact nature of it, um, we as adults, you know, we are called to, to, to do something about that. Finally, um, so just some closing thoughts. Um, I want to tell you my own story. I, like I said, I grew up in Northern Minnesota, same school I attended and my children are now attending. And I was told by very well-intentioned teachers, you're not like the rest of them. You're one of the good ones. I was student council president um, on my senior year uh, high school yearbook. I was voted uh, teacher's pet and least likely to get caught. But the reason why I say that, right, is because I was checking all the boxes that the majority white society teachers in that school um, thought then um, maybe an, an exception to the rule, right? That, you know, underlying that was the racism and discrimination against um, other indigenous students that was being voiced. Um, and, and I heard it. And as a, a high schooler, I wasn't sure what to do about it. But you can sure as heck bet that right now I uh, am speaking out and speaking up about that. I want us to understand that we shouldn't always expect our indigenous communities and our black and communities, communities of color, we shouldn't always have to bounce back. Right. We need to quit um, pretending that this is just on the individual and we really need to recognize the other forces that work here in terms of the policies, the procedures, the, the, the laws, the, the institutions that are perpetuating these cycles that we're seeing in our communities. We're tired. We're tired of being always expected to bounce back. It's time to create systems and policies that no longer require us to bear the brunt of burdens that were never ours to carry in the first place. Uh, it is time to restore the balance. Uh, it is time for heavy lifting and we all must come together um, to do that work. And with that, I uh, Miigwech for your time and attention today. Well, thank you so much for your testimony and sharing of the stories. Really appreciate it. Uh, do anyone have any questions? Uh, Chair Moran. Uh, that is okay. Um, Representative Baker fan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Lindsay, I just wanted to say uh, Chimi Gwich for, for sharing your story. I think it's um, we don't usually hear the voices of Native women um, in our committees. And so it was really important to hear from you today. Um, I also, I, I am also a Leech Laker, uh, but a Cass Lake Bina graduate. So maybe, maybe we played softball against each other <laughs> at, at some point. Um, but I think one of the things that you lifted up that I, that I think is really important um, to recognize in both your testimony today, as well as Dr. Dietz and Dr. Ellis is sort of this idea that um, these systems level issues, these system level problems are not the individual's fault. Um, and I think sort of in the same way that when we say that a system is racist, we are not saying you individual white person are the the one and only cause of the problem. You know, it isn't your individual fault that the system is like this, and it isn't like our individual fault as as Native folks or um, as as others that we we have these you know these different factors and these different systems that we're working against. And so I think um, just to sort of point that out because I think that you know we do still have this problem where if you say that something is racist, people get really defensive still. And so I think the more that we sort of um, make it clear with testimony like this that, um, you know, we're not, it's not to necessarily point fingers, but it's to say, this is the problem, but now it's on each of us to, you know, like as that elder you were talking about, it's on each of us to take the personal responsibility from here um, to make those systems better, um, you know, to recognize all these things. And so um, I just wanted to lift that up because I thought that was a really important piece of what you shared and and um, really just wanted to, to thank you and the other testifiers for this really, really impactful testimony today. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Baker Fan. Uh, do we have any other questions? All right. So, Lindsay McMurray, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come and present before this committee on racial justice. 
and to share your stories. Um, it does make a difference when we have a diverse group of individuals showing up um, in this body, sharing their stories, sharing their testimony, and sharing their expertise. So I want to thank you for taking the time to do that, along with Dr. Um, Ellis. Thank you so much, Dr. Deese. Thank you so much for hanging in here uh, with us uh, over the last two hours. We really appreciate your, your experience and expertise that you brought to this committee today also. Uh, as we get ready to close, I just wanted to remind everyone that we will be meeting next week on October the 6th. Um, the, on October the 6th, we will be bringing to this committee some information around historical traumas. Um, I think uh, sharing the, the traumas that we have seen um, within, especially within the indigenous community and within the uh, African-American community um, will be helpful as we work through this conversation around systemic racism um, and how we can look within ourselves and as a collective body um, to look at what 2021 could look at, like, or at the basics, you know, how we can just be more informed as we, as we do our work. Um, on October the 13th, the entire hearing will be devoted to public testimony. Members of the uh, public want you to remember that you can go to the House website and you can leave, uh, you can sign up for public testimony. If that is not possible, you can also leave a written testimony along with uh, a voicemail. And that information is there. We are asking an individual organization to provide up to at least right now three minutes of testimonies. And that just, uh, we'll start from there based on the number of folks who sign up to uh, testify. Uh, let's see. Uh, due to the nature of remote hearings, so, okay, I'll say that. And so remember to email your uh, uh, written testimony to Benta, Benta uh, Kate. With that, I know um, maybe I, we have a few minutes, we have like four minutes. So I think I'm going to hand it over to Representative uh, Damon to see if she'd like to do some closing words. And then we'll close it off with uh, Representative uh, Richardson. Vice Chair uh, Damon. Thank you, Chair Moran. Uh, to our testifiers today, Dr. Dietz, Dr. Ellis, and Ms. McMurrin, thank you for being here. The information that you each shared um, raised a number of questions and discussion. Um, I especially appreciated the information specific to Minnesota um, as we are looking to make decisions and determining what is going to be best for Minnesotans. That information alone is invaluable. Talking about our inequities and um, our uh, disparity in the achievement gap in school and even with our earliest learners is something of importance to take a look at. So again, thank you each for being here to the members of the public that have stayed with to gain more information. As we continue these uh, committee hearings moving forward and then as we have that public testimony, this is valuable time and we are looking to make that sustainable lasting change for Minnesota. So this is time very well spent for the betterment of all Minnesotans. Again, thank you for being here. And I will turn it back to uh, co-chair uh, Richardson. Thank you, Representative Damoth. I, I also want to thank all the presenters as well for taking the time to share information with us, Dr. Dietz. I, um, you know, some of the uh, key takeaways of your, your presentation, I think it was a really important note to understand that while we know that ACEs and toxic stress get under the skin, that there's also an epigenetic effect as well, and that it's something that can be passed down through generations. And I think that that was a really important insight to understand as we think about the generational impacts of, of, of ACEs and toxic stress. And I think another really just key piece was the um, references back to the Kerner uh, Commission report. I think that's just an important reminder that 
these are not new conversations that we're having. These are conversations that we have been having uh, for decades, but we're still continuing to struggle to really move the needle on addressing disparities and on addressing systemic racism as well. So thank you for uh, centering those two things within your conversation. Uh, Dr. Ellis, I first wanna thank you for sharing such a personal story with us today. Um, your story is, um, is not only important but very powerful because it really illustrates that with uh, adversity and with supports, what's possible. And I think the, uh, the key piece of what you talked about was really naming some of those key supports that are within our control as we think about how we are developing our funding uh, priorities. And the, the second piece of your presentation I think was just so important was talking about inequity by design. Our systems are designed this way and we have to do work to to address the way that the systems are designed. These are not outcomes that are just by you know, happenstance. It's because of decisions being made. It's because of budgets being made the way that they have been made or dollars being prioritized the way that they have been prioritized. So that was such a, a powerful piece of that as well. And finally, Ms. McMurrin, thank you for sharing um, a number of stories with us today. I think those stories are very powerful and the fact that there are 800 presenters across the state who can go out and share those personal stories as well. That is something that is great for the state of Minnesota. And I just really appreciate it. You highlight the need to really ensure that we are working towards community-based solutions and engaging the people within the communities to be a part of that solution, because I think that's just such an important part of the work that we need to do. So, and thank you, uh, uh, Co-Chair uh, Moran, for letting me uh, have the last <laughs> word today. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Representative Richardson. Um, we are in this together. Um, and so with that, but what we would do next week is that we will approve the minutes from today and from the 22nd as we move forward. Uh, and so with that, I want everyone until we talk to we see each other next week is to be safe. Um, and there being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>